Uh, hello, everybody. Mr. Mac here. Glad you're back. Chapter 14. That's what we're on. And um, at the end of chapter 14, I'll have a few more, two more pictures. There's two pictures left. The pictures have to do with chapter 14. <clears throat> but if you recall, in the end of chapter 13, uh, it was quite exciting. Uh, as a as a avid reader, meaning that you know I'm I've I've been a reader for eons. Um, it's hard for me to put a book down when it's a good book, when each chapter ends with um, a cliffhanger, a hook, ends with something uh, great authors use to keep us going. This book is a real page turner. That's just a phrase that simply means it's a good book. And uh, it's hard for me when I finish with you guys, uh, not to go ahead and just read the next chapter. I just can't do that. I want to I wanna follow this book as you are. Most of you, a lot of you have probably seen the movie. That's fine. Uh, you can compare the book and see if the book is like the movie. I have a feeling it's a great deal like the movie because the book was written after the movie. Remember, that's one of these. This is a novelization of the movie. But anyway, so at the end of... In chapter 13, Barley was real upset with Ian, if you recall. Um, that one police officer, Gore, had called Barley a screw-up, and when they were disguised as Colt, Ian and Barley, uh, Ian said, oh, no, I, you know, as Colt, oh, no, I think he's a good guy. He's a stand-up guy. He's, you know, he's not a screw-up. And, of course, when he said that, one of his arms or his leg or something disappeared. And the way the magic works is you can't lie, and if you lie, something disappears. Well, that, that angered and hurt Barley, that his brother thought he was a screw-up. And uh, anyway, so, um, you know, they're driving, they're going, they're arguing. Dad's in the back, um, you know. And uh, anyway, the Dad fixes it. He, he does what... Uh, parents do when our children are arguing he steps in and he tries to help he gets them dancing you know so they're all dancing and they've forgotten their woes and their troubles and well maybe not forgotten them but they're feeling a little better and finally Barley says to Ian you know you got to start listening to me and uh, Ian tells him hey I uh, this whole thing is uh, is you and Barley says yeah but we're doing it your way you're not letting me contribute so, Barley, Ian said, you know, you're right. And Barley said, well, instead of going to the expressway, we need to go along the path of peril. We need to take the path of peril and not the expressway. Ian was against it, but he understands what his brother is saying. And he's, and Barley's right. Ian says, okay. So they get in the van. Dad gets in the back. Barley's driving. They're going, and they're, it's a bumpy because it's a dirt road. It's not an expressway. It's bumpy. And anyway, one of Guinevere's, her back bumper falls off. My prediction was then, well, that's going to be a, an indicator, a bit of evidence. That's going to be something that somebody who's looking for them is going to be able to say, oh, they're going in this direction. And we know who's looking for them. We know that Colt is definitely going to be looking for them because at the end of Chapter 12, Spectre called Colt on the radio because Spectre knew that the Colt they were talking to wasn't the real Colt. Hooves footprints turned into boy footprints, you know. Anyway, so my prediction is was that uh, Colt's gonna get there, uh, go after, find them, look for them because Laurel and the Manticore are looking for them, and. It's going to be one of those things like that either Laurel and the Manticore or Colt are going to be driving, getting on the expressway, and then suddenly looking, oh, look at that road on the right. And they're going to, let's take this, and they find the bumper, and they know they're on the right track. So that's my prediction. So we'll see. All right, chapter 14, Laurel and the Manticore. I'm so glad we're back to them. I've been worried because, you know, the last couple chapters. Laurel and the Manticore pulled up to an old, unremarkable pawn shop. Now, you got to know what a pawn shop is. A pawn shop, uh, 
every state has one or 50. <laughs> it's a shop that will buy junk. It'll buy your stuff. And you want to sell something, take it to the pawn shop. They'll give you some money. However, if you take a trumpet and they got 50 trumpets, they're going to give you probably two bucks for the trumpet. But, you know, don't ever go to a pawn shop. But some people go to a pawn shop. So this was a pawn shop. Remember, man, the manticore said she knew where the sword, the curse uh, crusher was. So anyway, Laurel didn't understand why they were there. If we don't leave here with the sword, your boys are doomed, said the manticore. The place, when they walked in, was packed with televisions and armor and books and tarnished old musical instruments. A grizzled, lanky goblin named Grecklin placed a large garlic press on the counter. There you are, sweetie, one garlic crusher, she said. No, curse crutcher. It's a large magical sword. It's a curse crusher, said the manticore, frustrated. Hmm, sword, 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 I wonder, hmm. Grecklin was thinking, and she looked through some junk behind the counter until she finally held up this large, glorious sword. I mean, you know, I got this one. Will this do? The manticore gasped. Oh, that's it! Um, <laughs> how much, dear? Laurel said. Oh, said the Grecklin, looking at it, unimpressed. Um, let's call it, um, ten dollars. Great, said Laurel. And she started digging through her purse, got her wallet out, and as she counted out some money, the manticore gazed at the gleaming sword laying across the counter. Forged of the rarest metals, this was. The only sword of its kind in all the land. Oh, hello, old friend, she said. The manticore reached for the sword, and just as she did, Grecklin, bam, slammed her hand down on the sword. Oops, said the... Uh, said Grecklin with an evil smile. Turns out this sword is only the only sword of its kind. I was wrong when I said ten. What I meant was ten thousand dollars. You can't do that, said Laurel. Grecklin shrugged. Well, I just did. Well, you had better. And just then, Laurel's phone rang. I'll be right back. Hello? It was Colt. Hey, you know, I just talked to some of those officers, and they said the boys were last seen going north. Oh, are they okay? Oh, they're fine. But the officers said, well, honey, what they said was, let's just say this night keeps getting stranger and stranger. Laurel glanced up as the manticore leaned toward Grecklin. Do you know who I am? said the manticore. Oh, some kind of winged bear snake lady? said Grecklin. I'm a winged lion scorpion lady. I'll have you know, the manticore snarled. <laughs> Laurel focused back on her phone conversation. It sure does seem like a strange night. And she walked over to Grecklin. Listen, hun, I need that sword. My sons, well, they have a once-in-a-lifetime chance to see their father. Now, my oldest son, he... And then suddenly, the manticore whipped her scorpion tail, striking Grecklin right in the throat. <laughs> Grecklin's eyes popped open, and she collapsed. Laurel shrieked, Oh, holy God! You killed her! Oh, it's okay, said the manticore. She's only temporarily paralyzed. They peered over the counter to see Grecklin on the floor. Hmm. Grecklin mumbled through stiff lips, Oh, my neck, you can't do this. Well, 
said the manticore. I just did. Manticore said the same rude thing that Gricklin did. Laurel shouted, hurry, grab the sword. Don't touch that, oh, my neck. The manticore took the curse crusher. Here you go, uh, Laurel said politely as she placed some money on the counter. <laughs> and here's a little bit extra just, you know, for your trouble. As they exited the store, Laurel flipped the sign on the door from open to closed. Running to the car, Laurel and the manticore cheered. Yay! And Colt was still on the other end of the phone. Hello? Hello, Laurel, are you all right? Laurel picked up the phone. Oh, dear, hon, I'm so sorry. I forgot about you, but listen, dear, I can't talk right now. Uh, my boys need me. Click, and she hung up. Colt sat in the car, frustrated and worried. Wait. Dang those kids. As he drove to the expressway, something in the road to his right caught his eye. It was a beat-up rear bumper. Huh. He pulled up next to it to investigate and saw the license plate. The license plate said, Guinevere. Colt knew. He pressed his hoof on the gas and brrrr, and he sped down that road. He knew where they were headed. So, my prediction came true. Colt found. Well, someone found. We Colt found. And now he knows in what direction the boys are going. So, this is a time jump kind of thing. Now, this next bit doesn't start with meanwhile, because the author doesn't need to keep saying that. Once the author kind of says that a couple times, we can infer. It just starts off with, we're back with Ian and Barley and Dad. Dad and Ian snoozed in the back of the van while Barley happily sang as he drove along. We're heading on a quest, our father we must retrieve. The light foot brothers can't be stopped. Something, something, something that rhymes with retrieved. Oh, the van hit a bump. And Ian and Dad woke up with a jolt and Barley chuckled. Oh, well, good morning to thee, Lightfoot man. Oh, welcome to the path of peril. Ian blinked. Get the sleep out of his eyes. And he looked out the window. Huh. Open field stretched as far as he could see. Well, it doesn't look like the path of peril. Doesn't look like much of a path at all. Well, you know, uh, they never really developed around here, so, you know, heads up, because we could run into anything. Barley began scanning the area, taking his eyes off the road. Not a good thing when you're driving. Suddenly, Ian saw a huge drop right in front of him. Whoa! Stop! Barley slammed on his brakes and screamed, Aah! The boy stepped out of the van to see that they were at the edge of what looked like a bottomless chasm. If anybody's ever seen the Grand Canyon, gigantic drop. You look down, you see at the bottom there, you see the river that cut through it. Well, this is like that. Thousands of feet. They're right on a cliff, right on the edge, except there is no bottom. Mm, that's a little scary. Uh, Ian held Dad's leash. As he looked over the edge, Barley, what is this? It's a bottomless pit, explained Barley. Whatever falls in there, it just keeps on falling. And he pointed out an ancient drawbridge. You guys know what a drawbridge is, big castle. Usually have like a moat around it, like a lake or something. And a bridge has hinges, you know, bridges like this. Bridge goes over a, a creek or a waterway or something. Well, a drawbridge, uh, is attached to the castle. The castle's over here. And when the castle, the, the knights or whatever, whoever is in the castle has to get out, they lower the bridge and it goes across and they can go. And then when they're done, the bridge goes back up to help protect it. You know, that's what a drawbridge is. It can be drawn back up and let back down. E. Barley pointed out an ancient drawbridge. Look, if we lower that bad boy there, Oh, uh, we're on our way to Raven's Point. 
Look around, see if there's a button or a lever or something. Hey, oh, I found it, but it's on the other side. Look, said Ian, pointing across the cavern, the chasm. He landed, handed Dad's leash to Barley, and he lifted the staff. Well, hmm, let's see if I can do something about it. All right, I got this, let's see. And he held the staff out. Aloft, Elevar, he said. And if you remember, that was the spell that levitated things. So he was hoping maybe this spell would move the bridge. Magic did shoot out of the staff, but it disappeared halfway across the cavern. You can't cast a levitation spell on something that far away, brother. It only has like a 15-meter enchanting radius. Oh, Dad, you, you believe this boy here? <laughs> Thinks he's a mighty sorcerer indeed. <laughs> Ian stared blankly, not appreciating the humor. What we need, we need a trust bridge, Ian, explained Barley. That's a spell that creates a magical bridge that you can walk on. You just got to say this. You got to say, Bridge Regar Indicia. Bridge Regar Indicia. Say it. Ian practiced saying it over and over. Bridge Regar Indicia. Bridge Regar Indicia. Bridge Regar Indicia. He held out his staff and he said, he proclaimed, Bridge Regar Indicia. And the staff lit up. But there was no bridge. It didn't work. It didn't work, Barley. Barley pointed out, the staff is glowing. No, the spell's still going, brother. You won't know if your bridge worked until you step on it. What? Step on what? There's nothing here, Barley. If you believe the bridge is there, then it's there, said Barley. Ian looked at his brother like he was talking nonsense. Barley, look, it's not here. Well, not with that attitude, it's not, Barley said. Ian gestured to the empty air over the pit. Look, I'm not going to step out into nothing, Barley. Moments later, Barley was trying a, tying a thick rope around Ian's waist. He anchored the other end and tied it to a nearby tree. Dad was safely in the front seat of the van, his legs up, you know, crossed. With the window down, Barley gave the rope a tug, testing it out, making sure it's good and strong. He grabbed the middle of the rope, so the, the other end is on the tree. The other end is tied around Ian's waist. Barley's in the middle, kind of holding that rope. Ian, who stood at the edge of the pit, pointed that staff one more time. And the staff began to glow again. Uh, now look, we got rope, said Barley, but you're not even going to need it because I... Wait, I want the rope, said Ian, please. I'm just saying, said Barley, you're not going to need the rope because I know you can make the bridge, brother. Ian took a deep breath. Oh, and then he stepped over the edge and he fell. <laughs> but he got yanked on the rope, stopping. Ian was about 10 feet below the cliff, just hanging there by the rope. I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm dead, I'm dead. My life is over, screamed Ian. Oh, don't worry, I got your brother, said Barley, holding onto the rope, and he pulled Ian back up to solid ground and dusted him off. Okay, so you fell, but was it really so bad? Yes, said Ian. Hey, are you still alive? Barley asked calmly. Yes, I am, said Ian, considering the fact for a moment. Yes, Barley, I'm still alive. Okay, so now you know what's the worst that can happen. You'll fall. The rope will hold you. I'll pull you back up. That's the worst. You know it. You know it. You'll be all right. So there's nothing to be really scared of. 
because the rope will save you, right? Ian looked across the chasm to the other side. He took a deep breath again, repositioned himself at the edge and said, Bridge Rigar, Invisia. And the staff pulsed with magical power. Ian glanced down into the pit. And then he looked back at Barley. Hey, I believe in you, brother. You can do this, Barley said with certainty. Ian closed his eyes and he stepped off the edge and his foot <coughs> stopped in midair and planted itself on a glowing blue light that had just appeared. It worked. He's got one foot down, he's got two feet, but he, when he jumped, he jumped with one foot. One foot's up, one foot's down, and that foot is on a glowing blue light, holding him up above that bottomless pit. There you go, cheered Barley. Ian stood for a moment, holding his other leg up before slowly putting it down. But as he felt around, there was nothing there. Barley tugged on the rope, pulling him back, and then he shouted, You gotta believe in every step, Ian. Brother, you gotta believe in every one. You believed in that one, and that's good, but you gotta believe in the other. And the one after that, and the one after that. You gotta do it, brother. Ian probed again, hoping to find solid. Closed his eyes, and he concentrated. And he landed on solid blue light. Oh, yeah, said Barley. Ian took another step and another. Uh, brother, you got me right. Barley, can you hear me? You got me right. Oh, I got you. I got you. Woohoo! Ian Lightfoot is fearless. Ian took another step. Ian smiled. As if he were walking on air, he took one confident step after another, and soon he was standing in the middle of the chasm. He had done it. But what Ian didn't notice is as he was walking, the knot on the rope began to loosen. Barley's eyes saw it, though, and his eyes popped open. He knew he couldn't say anything about it. This is amazing, cheered Ian, still unaware of the loosening knot. And as he took a few more steps, the rope completely untied and fell into the pit. So imagine it. The ground, the tree, the rope, Barley's holding the other end of the rope around, and now it loosened and came off of Ian and just fell down into the pit. Yeah, it's amazing, brother, but keep on going. No, wait, don't look back. Oh, no, it's important. You got you to gotta keep looking forward, brother. Keep going. Keep going one step after the other. That's it. That's how to do it, brother. Don't look back. Just straight ahead said Barley, trying to hide his anxiety. Oh, you're doing great. Ian howled with laughter, feeling incredible. Oh, this is great. Barley, you still got me, right? You still got the rope? Barley looked down at the useless end of the rope, and he held his hands out, and he said to his brother, Yeah, I got you. I'm not afraid, announced Ian. Marching forward, he felt like a different person, suddenly fearless and bold. Oh, man, I could stay out here all day, Barley. He playfully shifted from one foot to the other, landing on magical light every time. He danced around and jumped and hopped and back and forth and over and up. Every time he landed on a solid piece of blue light, Okay, well, that's good dancing there, uh, Barley said. But, brother, you got to keep moving. Keep moving forward. Get to the other side. We got to we gotta see Dad, remember? <laughs> we got to get over there. Go ahead. Keep going. Ian stepped to the other side, where he kept stepping towards the other side. Hey, Dad, I got one more step. This step's for you. And when he said that, he looked back over his shoulder and saw that the rope had fallen into the pit. His confidence vanished, and so did the magic. Barley watched, horrified, <gasps> as Ian fell into the pit, the bottomless pit. Dun, 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 dun. That's the end of chapter 14. So, 
goodness gracious. Now you see, that's why I mean this book is a page turner. I'm dying to find out what happens. Now, I know I'm sure something, something's going to happen. He's not going to die. He's not going to fall down into a bottomless pit and, and, and be done from the story. No, the story's not over yet. He's the main character. So, with that in mind, my prediction is that I think Ian still has his staff. I think I think he's going to use a bit of magic to get himself out of that predicament. Maybe he's going to be able to use that magic to rise up. I mean, he did have the confidence to make that that imagination bridge, right? So he lost his confidence, yes. Maybe that was just for a moment. That's my prediction. I think he's going to get out of this using magic. He's going to rise back up and get over to the other side. That's what I'm thinking. That's what I'm thinking is going to happen. I also think that someone's going to finally catch up with them. Either Colt, who's now seems to be in hot pursuit on the road, or Laurel and the Manticore, or all of them. But um, I definitely believe that Ian's going to get out of this. He's going to use magic to come up. So that's it. So um, this is uh, tomorrow's Good Friday. Uh, so there will be no, um, you know, um, new newsletters or anything like that. The old ones will still be there. Um, Onward will be on the JBM PTO uh, page. So, you know, if you can, get your parents to get on there and, and, uh, and so you can listen to it. Um, and uh, there won't be another new newsletter until April the 20th. That's after spring break. And... Uh, you know, there won't be anything else going on. Uh, as far as school goes, this is our spring break. Um, but I will continue. I'm going to finish onward. I'm going to keep putting onward. Uh, it's only, we only have 18 chapters. We just finished 14. So, you know, we got four chapters to go, and we'll be done. Take care. Have a wonderful holiday. Don't drive your parents crazy. Stay clean. Stay healthy. Uh, keep your hands away from your eyes, nose, and mouth. And I wish you all the best and your families all the best. Take good care. And uh, let me find this button. Take care. Bye-bye.